All right, um, this, the second half of Investigation 3 has to do with what I like to call the reason for the seasons. And let's talk about this. So the first thing I want to talk about, the reason why we have seasons or what causes the seasonal variation that we experience here on Earth is what's called variations in incoming solar radiation. And there's a phrase that you'll actually see a few times in this particular lab called insolation. And insolation is basically a meteorologist's attempt, let me pull up my highlighter here, is basically a meteorologist attempt, there we go, at basically abbreviating something. So insolation, the in stands for incoming, the sol stands for solar, and the ation stands for radiation. And so insulation is just a shorthand term for incoming solar radiation. And what this graph right here actually shows is the month to month variation in insulation um, for three different latitudes. And the first latitude is these red dots. This is the equator. So this is locations over the equator. And if you were to actually connect these dots, um, which you can do, uh, let me really quickly grab a pen. If you were to connect the dots, it would look something like this. And I actually recommend, um, well, since I'm doing it right now, you can kind of take a screenshot. Um, but I recommend connecting these dots. It'll make your life a little bit easier and you can actually see the pattern a little bit better. And what you actually notice is that near the equator, there's really not a lot of month to month variation in insulation. Um, and what that means is that locations near the equator typically get the same amount of sunlight year round. Now there is a little variation. Um, if you notice, and let me go back to the highlighter here. If you notice, ah, there we go. If you notice, um, the months of April and October are typically when insulation is the highest, whereas the month of July, and then you'll actually notice this in, in January as well, tend to be the lowest. Um, and I'll explain why this is in a moment. Um, but basically what you're getting here is relatively small variation. However, there are two very little peaks and two very little dips. And that's common for the equator. And I'll show you why in a moment. Now, if you wanted to do the same thing for the mid latitudes, um, and this is actually the region that we live in, um, if you're watching this from Cupertino, the mid latitudes would look something like this. So just connecting the green squares and do 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 do. All right, connecting the green squares, and there you go. And so that represents the that represents the variation in insulation for the mid latitudes. And something you might notice here is, unlike the equator, where there's two different peaks, in the mid latitudes there's only one. In the mid latitudes there's only one, and it's typically in July. And the reason why is because this is right where the summer solstice is. Um, and then finally, the last one that you see, this line was already drawn in. This is actually showing you insulation near the North Pole. Now let me talk a little bit about what's going on here. So if you notice near the equator, there's really, the, this curve overall is not very well pronounced. It, it, the amplitude of it is not very large. It almost looks like a straight line, slightly squiggly. Um, and this represents very little variation throughout the year. And so areas near the equator are getting a lot of sunlight year round. On the other hand, as you move into the mid latitudes, there is a little more variation, actually much more variation. Um, they get a lot of radiation and a lot of sunlight during June, July, August. These are their summer, these are our summer months and not as much in December, January and February. And those would be our winter months. And then finally, if you look here at the North Pole, there is extreme, um, extreme levels of variation. Um, 
in some months of the year, there's practically no variation, or sorry, there's practically no incoming sunlight. And this is actually true. If you are in the North Pole, there is a long period of time where there's practically no incoming sunlight. It's just dark all day long. That, that's incredible. On the other hand, as you then transition into the summer months, it's actually light all day long. And so there's a lot of solar radiation coming in. And in fact, if you actually notice that during the summer months, um, locations north of the equator, here in the mid-latitudes and then up near the North Pole, actually receive more incoming sunlight on a daily basis than the equator does. Um, now, the reason why it doesn't get hotter here than at the equator or why it doesn't get hotter at the North Pole than the equator, um, imagine if you had a pizza in the oven and then you suddenly cranked up the temperature of the oven from 350 to 500. Your pizza would heat up a little bit, but then if you turned it back down to 350, um, it, it wouldn't heat up as much. Um, and so that's basically what happens here, is that in the North Pole, there's a little bit of heating, but they would need a lot more constant heating for them to get nearly as warm as the North Pole, or as the equator. And as you can see, as quickly as radiation peaks, it drops right back down. All right. So what actually causes this? Well, seasonal variations actually cause two things to change. The first one is the angle of incoming sunlight. And the angle of incoming sunlight greatly determines how intense it is. Um, when the sun is really high in the sky, then that sunlight that's hitting the ground is concentrated over a small area. And as a result, since it's concentrated over a small area, it's very intense. On the other hand, the lower in the sky the sun gets, the more that same beam of radiation spreads out. And the more it spreads out, the more diluted it is. So um, basically what happens is when the sun is high in the sky, the incoming sunlight is much more intense. When it's low in the sky, it's much more spread out, it's much less intense. Um, and then the other thing that is greatly impacted by seasonal variation is the length of the day. And the length of the day is um, something that varies throughout the year depending where you're at. Now if you live at the equator, there's no variation in the length of the day. It doesn't change at all throughout the day. Instead, the only thing that changes at the equator is the angle of incoming sunlight. Um, during the solstices, and if we were to actually go back to this image, if you notice that the equator gets more sunlight in the months of March and April, and then in September and October. And the reason why is because those are near what are called the equinoxes. The equinoxes, that's when the sun is directly over the equator. Whereas if you notice in January and July, these are what are called the solstices. During these times, the sun is actually lower in the sky near the equator. Um, during the summer solstice, it's over the north, northern hemisphere. During the winter solstice, it's over the summer, southern hemisphere. And as a result, the equator receives just a little less sunlight than it would otherwise get. And so that's why you see those two peaks and two dips at the equator. However, as you move away from the equator, both the angle of incoming sunlight and the length of the day both influence how much radiation a location gets. Um, so for example, in the mid-latitudes, you actually get pretty moderate fluctuations in both of these things. Um, during the summertime, not only is the sun higher in the sky, but it's also out for a longer period of time. And I'm sure that you know that, that during the summertime, the sun is out much longer. It's, it's rising at 5 a.m. in the morning and it's not setting till 9 p.m. at night. And so we're getting a lot more daylight, a lot more hours of daylight, but the sun is also higher in the sky. So that daylight is more intense. On the other hand, during the winter months, the sun is lower in the sky and 
it's out for a lot less amount of time. In these cases, the sun might not rise till 7 or 7.30, and it sets around 5. And in these cases, we get a lot less incoming sunlight throughout the year, or throughout the day, and it's out for a lot less time. So we're getting sunlight coming in from a lower angle, so it's more spread out, and for less of the time. Now, if you actually go to the poles, this is actually where you get the biggest amount of variation. Um, and the reason why is because if you live near the poles, there's actually times of the year where the sun is always below the horizon. And what that means is that there's no incoming sunlight. It's pitch dark. On the other hand, there are times of the year where the sun is always above the horizon. And in those cases, it's bright and sunny out all the time. One thing, though, about even those 24-hour days is that the sun is still always low in the sky. As a result, that sunlight that hits the North Pole is very spread out, and hence it's not nearly as intense. But because it's out for 24 hours, that means they're getting lots of sunlight when you add it all up throughout the day. And hence, that's what explains this variation. So take a moment and, and just review the idea that near the equator, the only thing that changes is the length of the day, is, or sorry, is the, um, is the angle of incoming sunlight. The length of the day does not change. In the mid-latitudes, both change, the angle of incoming sunlight and the length of the day. And at the, at the pole, there is a big change in the length of the day, even though the angle of incoming sunlight is always going to be low. Now with that said, uh, another question that you're going to be asked in, um, in the introduction section of this lab is to calculate these ratios of insulation. Um, and if you want, you can actually pause right now, go to those questions, take a look at them, and then come back and see these examples. Um, one of the questions asks, okay, the pole receives this much, or this percentage of radiation compared to the equator. To calculate this, all you have to do is take what you're getting at the pole and divide it by what you're getting at the equator, and whatever decimal number you get there, multiply it by 100%. And once you do that, you have a percentage. So in this case, I did 5.5 at the pole, 10 at the equator, and then I divided 5.5 by 10. That gives me 0.55, multiplied it by 100%, and that gives me 55%. Another question that you're going to be asked is you're going to be asked to compare one season to another, one month to another. And so they may ask a question like, okay, so uh, San Jose receives 12 kilowatts per meter squared per day. Um, and this is a uh, watts per meter squared is the unit of incoming radiation. And per day just means how much it's coming in per day. But um, so San Jose receives 12 in July and three in December. And they're going to ask you, so how many times more is San Jose getting in the summer compared to the winter? And to calculate this ratio, you just divide 12, the, uh, the maximum, what they get in July, by three, what they get in December. And so four times as much in this case. So that's how calculating these ratios work. The next thing I'm just gonna talk about really quickly is why any of this variation even happens. Well, the variation all has to do with the tilt of Earth's axis. So Earth orbits around the sun on a flat plane called the plane of the ecliptic However, Earth's axis, that's the line that goes up and down and actually represents the Earth's rotation, is actually at an angle relative to the plane of the ecliptic. And it's actually at an angle of roughly 23.5 degrees. Um, and this is probably a more exact number, 23.27 right here. But basically what's happening is as the sun is revolving around or sorry, as the Earth is revolving around the sun, uh, forgive the bloopers, as the Earth is revolving around the sun, uh, 
basically what's happening is the amount of sunlight received in one hemisphere is changing relative to the other. So during the winter solstice, what actually happens is the southern hemisphere receives a larger portion of sunlight than the, than the northern hemisphere. And you can actually see that on this image right here. If you actually take a look, more of the southern hemisphere is lit up than the northern hemisphere. During the equinoxes, both hemispheres are receiving the same amount of sunlight. And then during the summer solstice, this is in June, the northern hemisphere is receiving more sunlight than the southern hemisphere. And there's actually a few really cool images that they show that um, actually can help with this. So here's the first one. And this basically shows um, the fact that in September, uh, this is the 23rd of September, so this is the, uh, this is the autumnal equinox. Um, this is the first day of fall here in the Northern Hemisphere. Basically what's happening is if you take a look, both hemispheres are actually receiving the same amount of sunlight. And as a result, everywhere on Earth, with the exception of the poles, is experiencing a 12-hour day. Now if you're at the poles, um, you're either experiencing sunrise or sunset. In this case, what's actually happening is the sun is actually going to begin to travel south. Um, and so the North Pole is actually experiencing sunset, while the South Pole is actually experiencing sunrise. Meanwhile, this is actually that same image, but now for December, um, specifically December 21st. This is what's called the winter solstice. And if you actually notice, in this case, the Southern Hemisphere is getting a lot more sunlight than the Northern Hemisphere. But there's one other interesting thing to notice. As the Earth is rotating like this, as it's rotating like this, there are some portions of the Earth that actually will never cross the Terminator line into the sunny spot. And these locations are near the poles, and specifically everywhere north of the Arctic Circle is getting zero hours of daylight on this particular day. Meanwhile, if you actually look down near the South Pole, there are locations near the South Pole that are also not going to cross the Terminator line into darkness. And so these locations are getting 24 hours of daytime. And so on the 21st of December, the winter solstice, all locations north of the Arctic Circle are in forever darkness. And all locations south of the Antarctic Circle down here in the Southern Hemisphere are experiencing never ending daytime. And then six months later, the opposite is true. And basically what's happening here is now the Northern Hemisphere, or, and everywhere north of the Arctic Circle, is now going to remain west of the Terminator line. And so it's never actually going to cross over into darkness. And so they get 24 hours of day. Now imagine that. Imagine trying to sleep at night if you live somewhere north of the Arctic Circle. Um, I'm glad I don't experience that. On the other hand, locations south of the Antarctic Circle, here in the Southern Hemisphere, these locations are east of the Terminator line, and they're never going to cross over into the sunrise. So they're going to be dark during this time. But again, as the Earth continues to revolve around the sun, the position of the sun changes, and hence what eventually happens is um, sunrise happens at those locations, and then voila, they're now either in permanent daytime or permanent nighttime until the next season happens. Um, so that's it for this lab. Um, please feel free to use this lecture as much as possible. I do apologize for some of the bloopers, um, but I do want to get this video to you and, and I just hope that it's helpful for you. Uh, if you have any questions or need any help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, um, best wishes on this lab and yeah, let me know if you have any questions.